It's been said, John Gotti has single-handedly caused the destruction of the mob. In all fairness, that statement is somewhat over the top. Did one person bring down the mob or make it the shell of what it once was? Personally, I doubt it. Nevertheless, did some of the decisions John Gotti made attribute to the mob's undoing? Absolutely. Let's take a look into it. First and foremost, as a captain, you have to have control of your crew. In regard to the drug dealing that ran rampant with the Gotti crew, there could only be two answers why this was taking place. The first being Gotti couldn't control his crew, which was most likely not the case. And the second reason is he was in on it from the sidelines, which is most probably the correct answer. The tip of the iceberg for Paul Castellano's anger towards the Gotti crew was the drug dealing. It was commonly known that Castellano and Shinjiganti favored killing members who violated the no drug rule. So anyone ignoring this fact operated at their own risk. In November 1981, the FBI got a warrant for a wiretap to be placed in Angelo Ruggiero's house. They additionally placed bugs as well, and the audio surveillance carried on throughout 1982. The listening devices picked up Ruggiero and other members of Gotti's crew, as well as members from other families speaking about drugs. Confirming that the Gotti crew was indeed dealing narcotics was Willie Boy Johnson, an associate to the crew. Willie Boy began cooperating with the detectives from the Queens District Attorney's Office. On August 26, 1983, the FBI arrested members of the Gotti crew, including Angelo Ruggiero. The arrest and indictment of the Gambino members caused headaches for both Paul Castellano and John Gotti. Castellano's concern was that he'd be added to the indictment if it could be proved that he received money from the drug proceeds. John Gotti, on the other hand, faced a different dilemma. With the arrest and indictment of his crew on drug charges, it became an immediate reflection on him. As mentioned earlier, it proved he was either in on it or was a captain incapable of controlling his crew. Castellano and Gotti were overheard by an FBI bug planted in Castellano's Staten Island house. Their conversation centered around the recent drug arrest, with Castellano telling Gotti, look, Johnny, you better prove you weren't involved. Obviously, this became an issue for Gotti, because by this time, they learned Angelo's house was bugged. And besides talk of drug deals, there was a great deal of bad mouth in Castellano that went on. Prior to that arrest, Castellano told Gotti that he was seeking commission approval to kill another Gambino member, Pete Tambone, who was close to Gotti. Actually, it wasn't law enforcement who exposed Tambone's drug dealing, but another member of the family. Luckily for Tambone, Castellano decided to just shelf him, as opposed to killing him. The misconception that the Gotti crew had was they figured since Castellano turned a blind eye to the Cherry Hill Gambino's heroin trafficking, they too could dabble in narcotics. But what they failed to realize is the Gambino brothers were related to Castellano through their cousin Carlo Gambino. Nepotism and double standards are common in the mob. As boss of the Gambino family, Castellano had the right, after he learned about tape-recorded conversations between Ruggiero and others, to ask for the tapes. Before a trial, there's what's called discovery, basically where information is exchanged, including evidence, such as the tape recordings. And this is when they learn the existence of the tapes. So naturally, Castellano wanted to listen to them. John Gotti had a decision to make. Does he make Angelo hand the tapes over? No. Instead, he gets the Gambino underboss, Neil Della Croce, to intervene. In reality, he dumped a major problem in Della Croce's lap and caused unnecessary friction between an underboss and the boss. All Della Croce was able to do was to make excuses and stall Castellano. What Gotti should have did, he should have had Della Croce advocate to get Angelo shelved. Understandably, the tapes not only exposed Angelo, there were other guys on the tapes as well. But at that point in time, Castellano was zeroed in on Angelo and had it out for him. Let's not forget, he just gave a pass to Tambone, so it was likely Ruggiero would have got shelved as well. Angelo should have been told that he needed to fall on the sword. Gotti couldn't have been too opposed to shelfing him because it's exactly what he did after the attempted hit on Gaspipe Castle on September 6, 1986. As a result, Angelo was put on the shelf. Due to the mounting pressure from Castellano, Gotti, his crew, and other members of the family began devising a plan to eliminate him. As it turned out, they put their plan in motion on December 16, 1985. Paul Castellano and his newly appointed underboss, Tommy Bellotti, were gunned down outside Spark Steakhouse. Granted, the Castellano problem no longer existed, but an entire set of new problems developed. Being this was an unsanctioned hit on a sitting boss, Gotti created a number of powerful enemies. First among them was Chin Gigante, who was a stickler for the rules, but more importantly, a friend of Castellano's. Added to that long list of enemies were the Lucchese family's Tony Ducks Corallo, Vicar Musso, and Gaspipe Castle. 
As if that wasn't bad enough, the Castellano hit produced numerous enemies in camp, powerful ones like Jimmy Brown and Danny Marino, both well-respected captains as well as others, all of who were loyal to Castellano. With Castellano no longer among the living, in time, Gotti filled the vacant boss position. By naming Frankie DeChico as his underboss was strategically smart. DeChico was well-respected throughout the mob, especially within the Gambino family, and he would help calm the waters, which is what he was doing up until April 13, 1986, when a car bomb meant for Gotti blew him up instead. As far as the enemies were concerned, killing DeChico was the next best thing. But for Gotti and the Gambino family, losing DeChico came at a tremendous loss. In fact, many believe if DeChico had been made boss, the turn of events would have played out much differently. Castellano presented a big problem for Gotti. He was either getting broken down from his captain's position or killed. After December 16, 1985, he no longer had that problem. The smart move for him would have been not to put himself front and center. On the other hand, just as Steve Jobs didn't want to be known as just some guy who made computers versus being a CEO, I guess Gotti felt the same. As for replacing his underboss, Gotti first considered Angelo for the position, but that consideration quickly dissolved. Next, he picked Joe Piney Armone, who by that time was very old. The position eventually went to Sammy Gravano, who played a pivotal role in bringing the Castellano hit to fruition. Keep in mind, Sammy was passed over for the position not once, but twice. This was a family member who ran around fixing cases so Gotti could remain free. Nonetheless, Sammy finally gets the position. Was Sammy slightly offended at being passed over previously? Possibly. But if he was, he didn't show it. In my opinion, to blame someone for dressing flashy is ridiculous. John Gotti dressed the way he did because that's who he was. And he was a good dresser if I say so myself. There's nothing wrong with somebody keeping themselves well-groomed and dressing nice. I know in the past I've made comparisons of John Gotti and bosses in Sicily. But let's face it, he wasn't living on a farm in Corleone. Regardless, you can dress to impress and still keep a low profile. History is proven. A boss who avoids the limelight has a longer run. By Gotti relishing the attention, he placed a bigger target on himself, which was basically his prerogative. However, when he made it mandatory for captains and certain members to report to the Ravenite Social Club, he put targets on their back as well. I remember my friend Johnny Santori saying, when the agent seen him back by Ciro Perón's club after 20 years, they had to dust off his folder. And the same went for some of these Gambino members who were off the FBI's radar until they started to be caught on surveillance at the Ravenite. One of the biggest travesties was when John Gotti's brother Jeannie and Johnny Koenig were not permitted to take a plea. John Gotti made a ruling. Nobody's to plead guilty. As a result, they both received a 50-year sentence. And under the old law, they had to do 30 years. Meanwhile, years later, Gotti let his son take a plea. So you could just imagine how Jeannie and Johnny Koenig felt about that. The Ravenite tapes became the linchpin to the arrest of John Gotti, Sammy Gravano, and Frankie Lacasio on December 11, 1990. Initially, they were held without bail. On December 21, 1990, they had a hearing before Judge Leo Glasser to determine whether they would receive bail or be remanded until trial. They ultimately received no bail. At the hearing, the government strategically played some snippets of the Ravenite tapes. Worse among them was the recordings of Gotti badmouthing Gravano to such a degree that supposedly Gotti was squirming with embarrassment as his voice echoed in the courtroom, and Gravano's face was red with anger. For starters, talking openly, discussing murders and the reasons they were committed, was a lack in judgment. And at the Ravenite of all places, it didn't matter if the conversations took place in the apartment upstairs, or on the roof of the building for that matter. Those type of conversations should have never taken place. Lastly, as far as bashing Gravano, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. The following are pictures of Gravano by Gotti's side, holding umbrellas for him, and being a loyal soldier and underboss. On a final note, I began the video with a statement where John Gotti has been blamed for single-handedly destroying the mob. I've heard it numerous times while I was a member of the life. Is that my position? No. I know the deterioration of the mob was due to a number of people, not John Gotti alone. In reality, the only thing John Gotti destroyed was John Gotti. He was his own worst enemy. Mm -hmm.